So, yeah, welcome everybody to another very interesting session here at PCR London Valves. Uh, the topic couldn't be hotter, I would say. It's about Tavi and Tavi, Roadmap to Successful Lifetime Management. My name is Hendrik Tweed. I'm a cardiac surgeon from Mainz in Germany. I have the privilege to co chair the session together with Dan Blackman, interventional cardiologist from Leeds. And we have a fantastic panel that you can see here. So, um, our chat master today is Victoria Delgado. Um, we have uh, as speakers and co moderators uh, Giuseppe Tarantini, Jana Senethanen, Francesco Saya, Radoslav Palma, and Ole de Bakker. So, fantastic group of people. And uh, the program for today looks like that we go a bit through the basics um, and then through procedural planning, how to do these procedures. You know, this is very different from a native aortic valve stenosis table. And then we also have a recorded case that we're going to share with you and discussions all around this. The objectives for today I would not read. You can just read them yourselves, but it's clear we want to give you a clear roadmap on how to tackle this problem and how to come up with the best result for the patient. Okay, yeah, so thanks very much, Hendrik. This is going to be an interactive session. We've got a huge audience, which says a lot to how hot this topic is. It's getting on to the com with the conference. You're all pretty tired, probably had some late nights, but this is a su subject that is kind of a new field, really, a new area we're moving into. Yeah. None of us have got, some, has got much experience, but we've got a fantastic panel. So what we want to do is get you involved. We've got microphones all around uh, the room, so please go up to the microphones. We'll spot you. We'll um, bring out your questions. We're going to get out into the audience, so be prepared to get nobbled, especially if you know me or Hendrik, and uh, you're going to you're going to you're going to get uh, involved in the session. Uh, you can also ask questions through the app. They'll come onto the iPad, um, and the streaming audience can ask questions, which Victoria will answer. So Victoria will tackle all of your questions. We'll try and bring as many of them as we can into the session. So with that, I think we'll hand over to our first speaker, Giuseppe. Okay, thank you, Dan, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, as you can see by the title of my presentation, I need to make an overview on THV and THV, focusing first on what is important, and secondly, how to perform it. So actually, this is my disclosure. With my first slide, I would like to draw your attention to the second intervention. Actually, here you can see that when we deal with patients older than 75 years old, with this life expectancy, this is mainly based on the SCAR registry that is a surgical series. As you can see, the first intervention by guidelines is going to be TAVR, and the second intervention will be TAVR again. Because actually, the TAVR explantation has been you know, relate, correlated with an increase in 30 day and one year mortality up to 21%. Bad, yeah. Moving to the second subset of patients that is younger than 75, but an intermediate to high surgical risk. As you can see, the overall survival by surgical series is pretty much the same. Is five to eight years. That means that during the heart team, we can discuss if we have to go for surgery or TAVR, but actually, in many cases, we'll go for TAVR as the first intervention, and it is very likely, again, that the second intervention is going to be TAVR, because we have another paper with the same number of the previous one, 13% of mortality with TAVR explantation at 30 days, and one year mortality of about 30%. So the last point to discuss with all of you is the low risk younger patients, the expectation of life in this regard is up to 16 years. And here, probably you can start, actually by guidelines, you have to start by SAVR, but the second intervention, what might be in many cases, they're gonna be a surgical refusal. And again, the second intervention will be consistently the transcatheter approach. Having said that, I would like to share the first concept of this session for my presentation. So if the first intervention is SAV, we know that Tavrin SAV might be more favorable in terms of outcome compared to Redu SAV. But actually, again, if the first intervention is, SA is TAVR, Tavrin TAV seems to be more promising than Tavr explantation. So the concept number one is TAVR, in perspective, might be the most frequent second intervention in a lifetime strategy of the patients. This is pretty much reasonable. Second concept, we have two global leaders now 
that here you can see in the picture, actually, let's figure out, because we don't have definite data in this regard, that the durability is pretty much the same. We have data up to eight years. I don't want to bet anything versus one versus the other, but let's try to think the second intervention. If we know that the durability do not change much between these two, Actually, what we know is that tower explantation is much more difficult with a taller valve, 18% versus 8% of orthopedic replacement, and you know, bental procedure. And when you look at the coronary impairment, we have data, again, that is pretty much higher with a taller valve compared to the short frame. So actually, the concern number two is that the TAVI repeatability, for me, is as much important as the leaflet durability. Because we might have a valve that, do, that have a durability that is one year more. But actually, if it is less feasible to, make, to repeat the TAVI, it's something that we have to consider in a lifetime strategy. So moving ahead to the coronary axis. This is a very important part. We have many papers. Actually, I reported here three different experiences from different groups. The first two are forecast. The last one from Ole is not a forecast. It's a real case, city-based, Tavr in Tavr. Actually, in two-thirds of the cases, it's pretty much consistent. There is a kind of coronary impairment with a subranular valve. It's just one-third in case of short valve. And actually, this is without orientation of the valve. Well, when you move to the right-hand side of this slide, with the orientation of the self-expandable valve, you can increase, improve the coronary axis, but actually you still, you'll, you're still far away, 70%. You may go up to 80%, but actually you are you know, far behind the 95% of a valve that stay below the coronary artery. This is self-explanatory, I think. So what we have to consider, risk plane, VTA, commissural orientation, and finally sinus sequestration. So let's start from this slide to say that we can you know, identify three different patterns. When we go with a short valve, we stay in the type one, that means that the valve stay below the coronary artery. And this belongs to 79, 80% of the Sabian implantation. When you move to the type 2A, that means that you stay with the risk plane above the coronaries, and the VTA is larger, that is more than 2 millimeters. Actually, this is the distribution from the OCHI paper, is 90% in the core valve, 78% might be 2B. What is 2B? 2B is that you stay above the coronary, and you know the space, the extra space, outwards of the frame that you have is very tight. It's less than two millimeters. So actually, this is, I think, a novelty that we have discussed with Janar, with Ole, with many people here during the past days. And actually, we need to understand what is the VTA. The VTA is different among the different THV valves that we have so far. For instance, what we used to do on the left-hand side is to measure this, that distance. But actually, when you look, for instance, this is the accurate. When you tilt up the leaflets, the deflection is limited. And there is an extra space up to the frame. This means that the measure that you need to take is not the smallest one, but the other one. And actually, I'll try to be a little bit more clear with this bench test. This is a, an accurate NEO 23. Neo 2, 23. If you put inside a tube of 21, actually, depending on the STJ of the aorta, you have an extra room, as you can see by the yellow arrow, that might be from one millimeter, when the STJ junction is 21 millimeter, up to, to 2.5 millimeter of extra room, I think is clearly visible here. Having said that, there are other challenges that we need to mention. Even though when you go with basilica, actually with the second valve, when you go with the subranular valve, you need to be sure to orient the valve. Because if you finish up with the asymmetric skirt and the commissure in front of the left main, it's going to be a problem. 
in case of acute coronary syndrome or things like that. Another point is the misalignment of the mesh of the two valves. You know, without considering the leaflets, if you have a misalignment, actually you can see here, bottom right, it is very difficult to get through with a catheter. So there are a lot of challenges to be considered. So let's move from the what to how to perform procedural aspects. This is a recent paper that we published. It's a kind of operative guidance for the interventional cardiologist. And here you can have some clues as to move in a stepwise approach. You have to do a CT scan. You need to go for coronary obstruction risk assessment. And then you finish up with the sizing and the deep and the depth of implantation. That is the positioning. So let's try to sum up. This is a courtesy from Ole. Thank you, Ole, for this slide. So actually, we need to acquaint to the fact that we have new wording in this world. We have Neoskirt. What is the Neoskirt? It's the covered stent that you create when you tilt up the leaflet with the second valve. And this matters a lot, because you may thread the coronary axis. The second point is the leaflets overhang. I'm pretty sure that Janar will do a lot of drawings. He's a very good in this. And actually, you will see <laughs> at least. But actually, the point is that when you go with another valve into the previous valve, you might have you know, a kind of leaflets overhanging. As you can see in the middle of this picture, you have the leaflets of the second valve and the leaflets that are not totally close of the first valve. And this matters a lot because you can leave their residual gradient or you might create an impairment in diastolic feeling that may hamper the, the, the closure of the first valve. But actually, we will discuss it a bit more later. Point number two, city plan is almost everything. You need to have a kind of checklist you will see along with the session. You will have, actually, you need to know the index star, the measurements, the implantation depth, the failing mechanism, and the commissure alignments. So actually, pardon, going back, you need down there on the right-hand side, you need to measure the VTC and the VTA. Point number three, what is the mechanism of degeneration? When you look at the surgical series, the vast majority of cases is restenosis. Let's say it's more prevalent, not the vast majority. That, and this is mainly related to the type of valve. If the valve is stented or is a pericardial bovine valve, the, the likelihood to be restenotic is higher than to be uh, you know, insufficient. But actually, when you look at the right-hand side, we don't have definite data again. But actually, what we have seen so far is more prevalent the regurgitation than the restenosis. But we have to wait for further data. So actually, the point number four is to finish up with the sizing and positioning. For instance, let's figure out that the first valve is the accurate. When we go with the Sapien, we need to base the sizing with the CT native annulus, CT base matrix of the first, the second valve, mechanism of failure, and related post target of the final positioning. And again, you will see in a real case, and then I will finish this presentation how to move. So this is the medical history of a patient, 82 years old, tricuspid valve, NEO3, severe artistenosis. The first valve was the accurate NEO, L. 2016, the valve was pretty okay, I think. Ole, I don't know what you think, but it's almost ground zero, minimal leakage, more than acceptable. Six years later, there is a significant intraprosthetic regurgitation because there is a prolapse of non-coronary leaflets. So the points that we have to discuss, and we will do also during the case, etc., is what, what is, what is going to be the second valve? What is the size and what is the positioning of this valve? So actually, this is the stepwise approach that I follow. We need to know everything about the technical specifics of the first valve, not implanted valve. Then we need to turn out to the matrix of the implanted valve. And as you can see here, the inflow is not 30, but 27. Actually, you need to look at the commissural alignment down right, you can see that the angle is 40 degrees. 
is pretty much okay in terms of corner cannulation, but we have to think that when we go with the second valve, we create a covered stent around. So what is important is to know where to put the second valve, what is the position, to avoid the sinus sequestration, to avoid you know, the impairment of the coronary axis, and what matter is the mechanism of failure of the first valve. So this was my decision, Sapien 3, sizing was for 26, but actually what about the positioning? Actually the main mechanism is an aortic regurgitation. We don't have gradients. The leaflets are soft, are not stiff, are not doming. There is no doming. So actually the decision is to go to the inflow, to inflow, to leave out, let's say, 30% of overhanging and to secure the coronary axis. This is the way I went. And this is the result of the procedure. I went there, far below the commissure. Mid commissure is the way, you know, the, the leaflets are, you know, included in this valve. And this is the final result. As you can see, zero regurgitation. I went for selective cannulation to demonstrate that it is possible, even though you might create a cover stent, if you go a little, a little lower, because of the right reasoning, you can get the access, zero gradient. And here you can see down there the overhanging that is, you know, trivial, acceptable. And we will see what to do in the future. So in summary, the number of THV and THV implantation will increase. There are some risks that we need to find out the way to avoid. And actually, we need more data on durability of this procedure. Sizing and positioning is mainly based on, uh, we need to try to standardize. This is the effort to standardize and objectivate. So what is important, failure mechanism, city-based measurement, metrics, VTA, and different risk to you know, anticipate. Possible THV and THV has to be considered in the lifetime strategy of the patient when you plan and choose the first THV, mainly in patients with a long life expectancy, and the THV number one significantly impact the success of the second redo, both whatever it is, tav in tavi, but also tav explantation, as I shown you before. More science at the end is needed, so I think a very welcome prospective register in this regard. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks, Giuseppe. That was a very interesting overview, showing also you know how hot this topic is and. It seems as if we have to learn a completely new vocabulary here. So we are now dealing with things we never talked about uh, in the past, like VTA and, um, and uh, the Neoskirt and all these things that we have to take care of. And uh, maybe, Ole, just a question for you. Um, now, in the light of this, um, how did you change your practice in looking at CT scans and, and performing them? And, and what is the new, new scope we have to have in mind here? You mean for the index THV, THV or for if you have to do the redo, well, you're planning for Actually, for, the, for both. All inside this. Good. Yeah, I mean, good point. I mean, well, if we're treating younger patients especially, then we're going to think twice to think of the anatomy and the, the index TAVI valve, the type of valve we're going to implant. You have to take into account that these patients may come back, and then you have to not compromise coronary axis, ideally. So you're going to think twice, uh, do I go for a supraanalar or a long stand frame, short stand frame, supraanalar leaflet position, intraanalar leaflet position. These, these, these decisions you should take into account, especially, uh, I think, if your patient is below 75 years, and I'm for sure below 70 years. So that's one thing. Um, of course, it has a big impact on uh, all, how the whole aortic root is. If the SOV, ST junction is pretty large, you probably come away with it. If it's rather uh, narrow, then I think really I want to give that patient the best chances for a good, tough and tough outcome as well. But then also you will see in the cases I will show more at the end of this session that um, doing the tough and tough, I mean, it, now my whole mindset is different than two, three years ago. I mean, it's rare that we have these cases locally still, but um, in the past I, we were just thinking like, yeah, we just have to know the, the, the valve that's in, the, the size, and we, we put in a second valve. But I think you, it needs more than that. That's the whole session about. We need better planning of such a tough and tough. We have to ideally, ideally have a CT post-index TAVI and make our accurate measurements, precise measurements, 
and as Janar uh, also showed nicely in a paper, we, it, it's more complex than planning an Atavi in a surgical valve because that's a more static frame, that stand frame of a, of a stented surgical valve. The measurements you make on CT, uh, valve to coronary distance of valve to uh, C junction, that, that's typically fixed or you have to go for valve fracturing. In Tavi, there's so many other factors. I think I'm sure we come to touch on that. Uh, there are many factors that these Tavi valves, that the next Tavi valve can even further expand, etc. So the interpretation of your CT analysis becomes more complex. And I'm sure Janar will tell more about that as well. Yeah. Hendrik, we've got some questions from the audience. I think the first one's for you, actually, which is about surgical explantation. So, I mean, I'm sure we've all seen these data from ex the explant uh, registry and other registries showing very high mortality. But the question is, does this, in the reported series to date, also reflect the indication, which commonly was endocarditis or other early pathology rather than structural valve deterioration? I mean, do you think these high mortalities we're seeing at 30 days, you know, 15 plus percent, uh, realistic on what we can expect when we're explanting degenerated valves late? Yeah, I'm very glad you bring this up actually because I don't think that the data that we see right now with this very high mortality really reflects the surgical risk. So if you look at the time of explant, that was a between one and two years basically. So that means this is not valve degeneration, this is valve endocarditis or valve misplacement or whatever I hadn't. So, and then of course in an endocarditis in an 80 plus year old patient, the risk is higher, but not due to the procedure, but due to the circumstances. So I think we, if we would just look at degenerative valves and Tavi explant, I expect the mortality being around like maybe 5% or something. But it's still, and this I want to leave you with, it's still substantial surgery. Especially if we have, if we have a valve implant that this is a longer stent design because the aorta is always affected. And very often you have to do what uh, Giuseppe said. You have to do a band procedure, for example, to replace also the aorta. And then, of course, with every additional procedure, the risk is increasing a bit. And, you know, um, Giuseppe, you were pointing out that the second valve most likely will be a TAF. This is absolutely true, but it also, you know, gives us a bit of an uh, insight how important the first valve choice is, right? Yes. Um, because we know that there are surgical valves who are well suited for a TAF and SAF, and surgical valves are not suited at all for TAF and SAF. But maybe that same concept is also true for TAVI devices, right? At least, you know, some of them are much better landing zones for a future TAF and TAF than others. And this is also what has to come in our mind when we speak about the first procedure. And you, you pointed out the expression, the first cut is the deepest. So, so this might be a pretty deep cut, actually. I mean, the other point, I think, on the first procedure, just coming back to your question to Ola, is about the depth of implantation. You know, with most of the valves, uh, we've been pushed to go higher and higher, mainly to reduce pacemaker rate. But in younger patients, we're going to need to rethink that priority, um, even with the short frame valves. Um, with 19 millimeter frame height, sometimes we're going to need to deliberately in younger patients implant the valve a bit deeper so that the neo skirt, um, you know, is in a safe place when we come back. They come back for tav and tav. Let's get some. Uh, see if we can get some people in, from the audience involved. We've got another question, maybe um, for you, Giuseppe, about leaflet overhang. That uh, one of our audience members said they don't fully understand that concept. Could you maybe expand it a bit on what you mean by leaflet overhang? I can design probably. I can go there. So actually, the, the leaflets overhanging is a new concept. Actually, we need to have more data, even in the, on the bench test. But actually, for instance, let's make an example. When you have the core valve there, and you go with the Sabian in, so actually you have different nodes, let's say four, five, six, but actually to simplify, because we need to be as simple as possible. If you go inflow to inflow, Actually, you have the first leaflets that are tilted up, but not are completely, you know, di uh, displaced outwards. So actually, when you go inflow to outflow, we know by bench test, correct me, Janar, if I'm wrong, it is about 50% up to 60% of overhanging. That means that the first leaflets are not totally, are not fully opened. So the meaning of this effect is not clear on clinical ground. Actually, there are some bench tests that says that you might have a residual gradient, you might have an impaired diastolic feeling that might impede you know, the appropriate closure of the second valve, but actually we don't have clinical data. The point is that all the time that you risk to occlude the coronary artery, you need to be aware to the fact, you need to find out the best trade-off and to say probably you need to, to go deeper and not to go at the level of the commissure to avoid the sinus sequestration. 
knowing that if you have 30%, 40% of overhanging, and the make, main mechanism, the aortic regurgitation, the clinical impact is close to zero, at least that's early follow-up. We don't have long-term follow-up. A total different story is when you have a severe risk stenosis. In this case, if you don't have any risk of sinus sequestration, you can go a little higher to avoid this overhanging. Otherwise, you need to find out the compromise on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't know if it is clear, but... Giuseppe, can I ask you just one more point on that? You alluded, I think, in your presentation of that Acura Neo case to a difference between regurgitation and stenosis as the mechanism of failure. How does that affect your consideration of leaflet overhang? Yes, this is another point. Actually, we don't have data because we don't have, we don't know exactly the prevalence of risk stenosis versus insufficiency among all the different THV valves. What we know is that there is an higher rate, it seems to be like that, of regurgitation compared to the surgical valve. Actually, with the accurate, the point is that when you have a regurgitation, actually, I recommend to go a little deeper and to accept a little bit of overhanging because based on the case we have collected so far, we have, let's say, about 15 to 18 cases of, uh, you know, risk and not, let's say, failure of the accurate. And when you go with a deep implantation, a little over overhanging it do not result in any gradient or any impairment of the solid feeling. So this is what we know by practice, to be honest. But uh, I guess um, is the question that if you have stenosis, that leaflet overhang to avoid coronary obstruction may not work in the same way as a thin regurgitant leaflet. Is, is, that, a, is that a concern, that if it's stenosis, leaflet overhang yes, will not be in a, a, a strategy to avoid coronary obstruction? I want to make a draw just to understand. When you deal with, you're talking about accurate. Any valve, if the Any leaflet okay, if it's failure is stenosis. Okay, when you have a stenosis, actually, here you have the commissure. And here there is, let's pick, you know, the accurate. Okay, when you have a risk stenosis, you have a doming here. Actually, ideally, you need to go at this level with the second valve mid portion of the commissure because at this point the leaflets are, are attached just to you know tilt up the leaflets to not to don't have any residual gradient but actually you need to understand that if there is this space that is really roomy you don't have you don't threat the coronary so you can go a little <coughs> higher at the level of the waist and the commissure but actually when you have this part that is a VTA that is really shallow, that is really narrow, my recommendation is to accept something in between and to avoid the sinus sequestration. And another point is that actually, actually when, this is the aorta, when we measure the VTA here, probably this is not the right way to go because this is true for the surgical valve. We know that with accurate, for instance, the maximum deflation of the leaflets is like that. So you have an extra space that might be from one, for instance, to two to 0.5 millimeters. So it might be more forgiving when you have all this information and to choose the right size, the right position based on any given valve. I only... Well, Victoria, can I ask you, I mean, we had discussed about the issue of leaflet overhang in the way of valve function, also in the way of uh, coronary obstruction, but do you have any concerns about thrombosis? Well, that's an important issue, and indeed it has been seen that sometimes in the neo uh, sinuses there could be some uh, concerns of stasis of blood, but indeed many of these patients may be already on anticoagulation. So this is a field that we are learning from it. It's also uh, possible that even uh, a simple tabby can have that, or a surgical valve can have those thrombosis, and we will need more data from this but it's a field going on because even in the regular TAVI, uh, the trials that have been tried to uh, check the feasibility or the safety and efficacy of uh, several uh, anticoagulation regimes are not still conclusive. Perhaps Ole can, can comment as well on, on that from the Galileo. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look to the just pure TAVI without the context of TAV and TAV, I mean, there's no good arguments at all to, to anticoagulate these patients uh, more, uh, except for their need if they have atrial fibrillation. All the trials we have so far, they're 
just pointing out that they're bleeding more, these patients, there's even higher mor mortality. So I don't think <clears throat> we have not had the tradition putting TAVI in surgical valves to anticoagulate these patients uh, systematically. I think the same is valid. At, I mean, our, our evidence and data is, is, is very poor still, but as long as I do a TAV in TAV, I don't necessarily put that valve, uh, that patient on uh, anticoagulation. No, uh, yeah, there is uh, the, the, the rationale behind uh, thinking that uh, anticoagulation may work in, in TAV in SAVRE and in TAV in TAV as well. But as you mentioned, I mean, there are no data pointing out because you know the rationale is that you may have some more material there behind, some more uh, stasis of the blood. But all the data, even in, I mean, minimal data, but even in TAVI and SAVI, uh, in SAVI at this moment, do not point out for a, an advantage of anticoagulation. The, ab the absence of proof is not the proof yeah. of absence. So we need more data for sure. Yeah. But, but one thing, because now we're in a session of TAV in TAV, where anticoagulation comes in play, and you have to think of is if you have a patient with a TAVI, you did TAVI on this patient five years ago, and he presents suddenly with an increase in gradients again, I think there, there is a moment, I think of, you may consider of leaflet thrombosis, you should screen for it, ideally mid, with CT or maybe TEE, and if that confirms there's leaflet thrombosis, maybe anticoagulate these patients first uh, empirically with six to 12 weeks of anticoagulation therapy, and sometimes you will see that these, these uh, leaflet mobility and the thickening disappears, the, the mobility becomes back, and then you don't have to go for a TAV in TAV. So don't, don't be too easy with your conclusion. I have to do a TAV in TAV here. Maybe take a step back, assess really good with CT, additional Im multimodality imaging, and maybe there is some place there, a window of anticoagulation. Yeah. yeah, this nicely relates to the next topic we have. This is a proper CT planning, and Jana is going to show us how to do this, actually. But before we well, while he moves over, Rado, you had another comment to make. Just a very short comment. I will refer to what Giuseppe Tarantini was saying about the nominal expansion of leaflets in certain prostheses. In some of them, the leaflets do not open fully and may allow coronary uh, reintervention. But if the mechanism of uh, failure is leaflet tear, uh, which usually occurs at the commissures, these leaflets may open fully up to the frame. So in that case, the coronary access may be more difficult. Okay, it's me? Okay, mm. great. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm just going to go through a little bit on CT planning, uh, but leveraging some of the work that we've done on the bench, just to gain, stress the concepts about what's novel and different about TAV and TAV and how you can apply it to risk prediction. We're going to use the case that you're going to see as a recorded example uh, as a base. So thank you for the team from Cardiff for sharing their CT planning. Now, the first point I want to make is that if you look at what we're familiar with, which is treating failed surgical valves or TAVI, this is very established now. You can see, I apologize for my handwriting. I was critiqued about this at a session yesterday, but you'll just have to bear with me. But what is very consistent, and of course what we're all very familiar with dealing with, taught by Danny and others, is that if you have a leaflet of a surgical valve and you put a TAVI valve in, that becomes pinned, and this becomes the wrist plane, because you have a tube graft, and we are only concerned about the relationship to the coronaries. So the three things, so the neoskirt is essentially this height here in a surgical valve, but what is very consistent, you know, if if Hendrick's going to do a valve, he's going to put it in the same position, right? Surgical valves are very consistent. Uh, and the expansion, so the direction this way, unless you're planning to fracture the valve, is also very consistent. So what I will hope to stress to you, if we just go to my slides now, is that when it comes to TAV and TAV, each of the, these things are incredibly heterogeneous. Uh, and what I will stress just from lessons we've learned from the bench is that each valve, when it fails, should be viewed in isolation. We talk about personalized medicine. This is personalized case planning because they're all slightly different. So the four concepts as they apply are neoskirt height, leaflet overhang, index THV expansion, and leaflet deflection. So we looked at a fairly comprehensive study relative, relevant to the case that you're going to see, looking at bench testing of different size sapiens at different positions inside an Evolute valve platform. And that was published earlier this year. So I think when it comes to pre-procedural planning, planning is the key to success, as we all are aware. So you want to get as much information as you can, and we can break this down into two index things in my mind. The first thing is the index CT. If you have access to the original CT before the patient had an index 
Tavi, that's going to be crucial because it's going to factor into your annual sizing, but also into assessing for adverse risk features if you have it, because that's going to impact what you choose for your second valve. Then the post-index THV CT is equally as important because you're looking for differences in THV expansion that can vary quite dramatically across THV sizes. The mechanism of failure is important. You often get that information from ECHO. But of course, the risk of coronary obstruction is absolutely crucial because everything we have published now you know, from Uri Landis series or the TVT data shows that TAV and TAV is successful, but this is a subset of the population because we've all become very good at identifying coronary risk. And so there's a large proportion of patients that are uh, excluded. So when you look at the index CT, if we use the case that we're going to see today as an example, you can see that it has a perimeter of 75 and falls very much in the range of a 29 evolute. And what's nice about the annulus is there's no adverse root features. However, what about this situation? And that's why we stress to look at that index CT in that you can have an annulus that is in between two sizes, right? Either for an evolute or for a sapien, for example. And you know, if I'm in between two sizes, for example, I might take a 23 sapien, but you know, Giuseppe, who's got far more style and grandiosity than me, might take a 26 because he likes things larger. But what that means is that when you're in there putting the second valve in, you should be cautious sizing purely to the valve that has failed. The other reason to be cautious is that if you have adverse root features and you're going to use a balloon expandable valve, you, you have to be cautious with your sizing because there may be a risk of annular rupture. So now when you have the post-index THV CT, the same thing, and we've just shown some examples just to give you a flavor of the type of, of screening that you can do, but it's the same concept again. And you, you want to size again for the annulus if you haven't got that index CT. And you can do that by, by aligning to the actual cusp, the annulus itself, or aligning to the THV and panning up. And you can do it both ways. So in this case, it's actually very, very consistent uh, around an area of 460, 454. Um, and again, you can pan up and down to look for adverse root features. And it's another check, if you, another setup if you don't have that index CT. So in this particular case, it falls very much in the range of a 26 Sapien S3. And this is the sizing algorithm that we used in our paper. Um, so 20, 23, 26, and 29 in a 23, 26, 29, 34 Evolute, respectively. So now when it comes to neoskirt height, what's crucial, and we just wanted to show an, an image uh, that illustrates the point that you can have dramatic differences in terms of your neoskirt height. And you have some valves that are short and some that are tall, and it's not to show any specific design, but suffice to say that generally, if you have a short frame valve, your neoskirt height or the wrist plane will be higher when a taller frame valve. But the risk can, the, the height of the neoskirt, again, is not the same across all tall frame valves, and in fact, can be very, can differ. So back to the slides, please. So then we talked about the node position, and we again showed here four different positions relative to the node height. If you go to node seven, that's the ultimate pinned height of the evolute valve. And so we looked at four different heights, four, five, and six, because you can reduce the amount of the effective neoskirt height by going lower. That makes sense. But if we want to see what leaflet overhang is, here it is, because this is node four, node five, and node six from left to right of the screen. And you can see over there that when you go to node four, you can have as much as 90% of leaflet overhang. So it's almost like two valves in series. But when you get to node five, it seems to be a reasonable compromise where you have a neoskirt that's not so high as to the right, but you, have, you still have a degree of leaflet overhang. And to Giuseppe's point, we don't know the long-term implications of this and what it means. So when we look at this case, you know, you can, you can do two views where you align um, to the left main. And generally, we try and swing to an LAO cranial view because that's similar to what we're going to do in the case. And, you know, the reason I say that, and I'll show this with, an, with a fluoro picture, but here you can see you can just draw a straight line up. And generally, 26 millimeters is what you can use. We use 28 just to account for some size ranges. But, or you can put in a virtual valve if you would like, and I've just shown both examples here. But here you can see in this particular case that we're going to see both the left main 
and the right coronary artery arise well above the wrist plane. So this is a very low risk of coronary obstruction in this particular case. So the other thing to look at on the CT, and this is examples from another case, this is a sapient case that we treated in Vancouver, you can see that it's very important to think about the expansion of the valve that you're putting in. And this is an example of a sapient of a 23, where the waist of the valve is only 20. So you might want to optimize that if the annulus will allow it with the predilatation selectively in some cases. Now, the VTC is important. Now, what is crucial when it comes to an evolute valve, if we go back to the um, smart screen, please, is that when you put a sapien valve in, and this is, this is the evolute valve here, generally as a waste, for example, and when you put the sapien in, it tends to go like this, but often you can get some constrainment. But what we saw on the bench was that you get some expansion that occurs at that level. And you might have a coronary sitting right here. So if we go back to the slide, and I focus your attention just on the top right-hand corner of my slide, if you can have the slides up on the main screen, yes. you can see that this is Philip Blanke's original description of the VTC. But you need to account for what the expansion would be because it might be that your VTC is actually at risk. Now, if in this case, both coronaries are above the wrist plane, so that's not a concern. So this is the root angiogram from the case we're going to see today. And you can actually see, you can count your nodes all the way up. And what we do is we go in an LAO cranial view with the valve aligned. And generally, in an LAO cranial, we learned this from PCI. Jean Fadege taught this us with left main PCI. That's good for isolating. The right often arises higher. And so here you can see that in this case, your wrist plane is there, your coronary is above your safe. This is a case we had in Vancouver where it looks like a pretty big evolute that we put in, and it probably was. But here you can see in the same view on the same root picture, this is an extremely high risk for if we were to need to repeat this of coronary obstruction. So in summary, I think this is a low, low risk case for coronary obstruction. I think the sizing for me is a 26 and 29. And uh, Francesco is going to talk through a little bit about positioning. Thank you, Janana. I, I think after these presentations, uh, my task is quite easy. I mean, I just uh, need to uh, recap some concepts and simplify a little bit uh, what is going to be that we need to uh, consider uh, at the end when we have done all this work, preparatory work, then the procedure. Uh, all, all the choices come quite easy in mind. So uh, just uh, let's put it into perspective. So the key factors that we have to consider are number one, mechanism of degeneration. Giuseppe elaborated very well about that. Second, first THV design and position. And number three, the anatomy of the aortic root and the interaction between the valve, the first valve, and the anatomy, of course. And we need to analyze the baseline CT scan as we uh, have heard from the previous presentation. So, for example, let, let's make a very simple concept, okay? Mechanism of degeneration, again, if it's regurgitation of, it, if it is stenosis, why it changes? Because, you know, basically, if it is a regurgitation, we know that the valve is not, uh, if we have some overhanging, this will not uh, create gradients above our second valve. Okay, so we can accept some limited overhang, and we don't know, of course, if you know, the, the, the alteration of the flow in diastole will uh, also create some problems over long term. We will learn about that, but in general, this is not a problem in terms of gradient. If we have a stenosis, we need to consider that, because if we leave a stenosed valve in series with the second valve, this may be an issue for residual gradients, okay? So basic concept. And this, again, Let's see what is uh, leaflet overhang. Again, this is a different perspective. You can see here a sapien in a core valve. This is the risk plane illus illustrated here. And you see that above the first valve, we have the second, uh, actually above the second val valve, we have the first one uh, and the leaflets of the first one staying there. We don't know what this means in terms of flow, diastolic flow. So. And this is another illustration from a different perspective. Again, you can see that based on how high or low you put your valve, you can see actually completely different overhang. And with 
going up to 90% if you implant the second valve law and you can leave 90% of the first uh, TAVI leaflets above. So back to this basic concept. If we have regurgitation, we also should ask ourselves, it is only central or do we have any paravalvular regurgitation? If we have a paravalvular regurgitation, we go back to the first CT scan. Was that the sizing of the first valve, was it correct? Number one. Number two, if the sizing was correct, can we expand the first valve in order to also resolve the problem of paravalvular regurgitation? So this may, may have some procedural impact, okay? So in these cases, you may aim for over-expansion of the first valve, post, uh, a pre-dilatation, let's say, as uh, uh, Janar mentioned, or you may aim for just an over-expansion even beyond the limits that you can go in order to to uh, reduce the paravalvular regurgitation. And this is well illustrated in another paper by Janal. You can see here, consider that self-expanding valves have a quite uh, uh, some room to increase their size when you put uh, a balloon expandable valve inside. Okay, so you have to consider this for the reason that I mentioned, and most importantly, perhaps for what Giuseppe mentioned. When, when you expand the valve, you have to consider that you are changing the distance from the valve to our and all the parameters that we have been discussing thus far. So the risk of coronary should be considered. The VTC or VTA, we need to you know, get familiar with this, uh, uh, these uh, no. terms. So going back to stenosis. Stenosis, let's say, in a way, it's easier. We should not leave overhang uh, the concept. But again, we may have some difference because you know, uh, if we are dealing with small prosthesis, maybe we should aim for a higher implantation to avoid uh, uh, patient prosthesis mismatch. This is something that you have to consider, especially when we are planning balloon expandable valve in balloon expandable valve of small sizes. Okay. Second key factor, the first THV design, we need to go back to all the metrics of these valves. We need to have a table in the cath lab and we need to go back to that. And I explain you why easily. Take a look at the core valve in this case. I mean, look at how different are the sizes if you implant at the level of the inflow of the valve, it's a 29 millimeter, or if you implant high, it's a 23 millimeter, the annulus. So this may change also the size of the valve that you are going to, to, to choose, okay? You, so you need to know all the metrics of the valve, where are the leaflets, how is the, how is the design of the valve, everything. Okay, and the risk plane, the concept of the risk plane now, it's easy to me because it's been already illustrated. It depends on the height of the leaflets, but also on different parameters that we uh, can modify, just modifying the height of our implantation. So again, this is the concept uh, that Janar illustrated, the height of the implantation. The, the lower I implant, uh, the lower will be the neoskirt and the risk plane. The higher I'm going to implant the second valve, the higher I will move the risk plane. Okay, so I, I will increase uh, uh, the risk of coronary uh, occlusion. And all these things we have to put into the anatomy, of course, because if we have a very large anatomy, very high coronary, this is not an issue. If we have a small anatomy, aortic root, and then so we need to consider the interaction of what is the first valve, what is going to be with the second implantation. So we need to uh, consider if our patient at the end will be high risk, low risk uh, of coronary obstruction and so on. So general rules, basics, uh, there are some general rules, but as, you saw, uh, as I mentioned, the factors then that can modify these general rules, we have to consider that. But in general, balloon expandable valve, in balloon expandable valve is the same size. The position is outflow to outflow. Consideration are the ones that I did about over expansion of the first one, lower or higher implant to reduce the risk of patient prosthesis mismatch. For example, uh, sapien in core valve, in this case, we have some general rules, again, 20 and 23, 23 and 26, and so on, about sizing. But you saw how different may be the choice about the positioning. So the outflow, in general, should be around node 4 to 6 to avoid leaflet overhang. But we mo can modify this if appropriate. And then there are you know, different considerations, so different sizes depending on uh, different positions that you, may can, you can uh, choose. Or you, you need to tailor your implantation. This is really tailored uh, to the patient. And, and of course, this is something that you have to do with all valves. Every valve has some different characteristics, every first valve. Uh, 
uh, and every second as well. So final consideration on the patient that we are going to see. This is, uh, you will see the case uh, in details, but this is the valve, how to, it will appear. It's uh, Evolute 29 degenerated. Uh, it has a central regurgitation and a paravalvular regurgitation. The implant depth was 15 millimeters. There was no commissural alignment. This is another factor to consider, which is in this case is not so important, but anyway, in many cases may be relevant. The risk plane, it's a node seven, six to seven. So what are the recommendations for THV and THV in this case? Uh, THV is a Sabian 3 Ultra 26 millimeter. The high, the implantation depth, we should put uh, the valve at a high position in order you know, to, 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 to have uh, no leaflet hovering and, uh, and here we don't have the risk of coronary uh, compromise. And, and final comments, we should aim also a little bit for some over expansion of the first THV in order also to uh, reduce paravalvular or abrogate paravalvular regurgitation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Francesco. Um, we're a bit late in time, but there might be time for a couple of questions from the floor, right? Um, Dan, do you have any? Yeah, well, well, we've got a couple of comments and questions. One is, is there any plans for a TAV in TAV app? That's, that's in process. Okay, so you're working on that, John. Well, Vinny, Vinny is working with it, and me and Uri are helping him, but um, yeah, that's in process. Okay, yeah, I mean, that, we can clearly see how helpful that will be with all these numbers, but I mean, until we've got that app, Giuseppe's paper from Jack Intervention uh, with Jana has all of these tables telling you about different neo skirts heights depending on depth of implantation of the second valve. Um, another comment is, do you have problems crossing uh, with your second TAV valve? Uh, and if so, are there any techniques that you can recommend to help with that? Is it for me? Uh, on Giuseppe, go for it. I can say something about that. So when you cross the arch, I think, and you decide to go with the second valve that is the Sapien, you know that you have a knob and you can change the angle. Sometimes when you deal with supranular valve, you need to be careful to not hit the top row of the leaflets, for instance. Again, with the accurate, you might bend completely the stabilization arch, you need to go back. It's pretty much the same with the others. So you need to go really, you know, smoothly in and this is an advantage of this delivery system that you can nicely regulate the angle when you get into the first mm -hmm. valve. I don't know, Francesco. But, but one thing, I mean, the crossing really, that's a good point. I mean, you have to be careful. Don't cross just with the wire first or with the turumo first. I mean, you may hit through yeah. one of the struts. So do it yeah. with a pigtail, go in a pigtail, go into yes. the, the, and then, and then do the crossing. And then there's some additional thing. Maybe I come to touch on that uh, for accurate crossing that you make sure you're not on the outside of the, there's some trick. I will show that I think in my case. And also to use, to use several projections to make sure that you're not uh, going through the valve from the outside. Just to make sure that you're central through the valve orifice. But just avoid the remote or just go with a pigtail into the frame, take a, a regular J wire or something and, or, or a straight wire and uh, try to cross. But that's harder, going to be harder if it's stenotic. If it's a leaking uh, valve, that's, uh, if it's a stenotic valve, it may not always be easy. No. Yeah, one more question that is from me. Um, <laughs> you, I think you talked briefly about pre-dilatation. What's the role of pre-dilatation with Sapien uh, as our second valve in particular, or, or with other, other devices? Is it something that we need to do? And if so, why? How can it help? Well, you, you know, we, we've done about 20 cases of Sapien and Sapien. And you know, we are looking at this more and more, partly because what we found clinically and what we've seen on the bench is post-dilating afterwards is not necessarily easy when you have two layers of frame. And particularly when, with the older generation XT, uh, you know, often the inflow is much smaller. And it's very hard to post-dilate those with the semi-compliant balloon and even non-compliant. So we have selectively ballooned aggressively uh, and you know, expanded it up. The only thing you have to be, and we learned this the hard way, is we had a case that had paravalvia leak. We ballooned with a 23 true balloon. We made that valve 25 millimeters because we did not account for the fact that a degenerated leaflet can be as much as a millimeter on either side. So we had very good expansion of our new case, but we got away with the case because we didn't have any annular calcium, but that ended up being a much bigger thing. So I think it's really important to optimize the expansion of the second valve because we're seeing emerging data that having a waste might be harmful. 
And do you think predilatation can also help with stability when you're, de when you're deploying the valve? You know, it, is there a risk, some, especially with an under-expanded first failing valve, that you may get a degree of melon seeding yeah. when you deploy the uh, second valve that predil right. might help with? Well, I'm not really sure whether it, that helps so much. I mean, I think ultimately the, the risk of melon seeding is pretty high, actually. We often try and go harder, but when the balloon goes up, it sucks it in, despite whatever you're doing in terms of pulling. It's not necessarily easy to do that. I mean, I think more crucial is how slow you're inflating. And I think if you're thinking slow, think like the same pace you would do a mitral valve and ring, right? It's not a straight up and go down, go super slow, and then you might have the option to position whether it's sapien and evolute or sapien and sapien. The only small hint I could give is to make sure you're using non-compliant balloons for any predilatation, just to make sure that this, this procedure is effective. Well, I think there's a word of caution. If degeneration is the mode of, um, uh, if insufficiency is the mode of degeneration, then you might have leaflet prolapse, even leaflet flail. And if you then predilate, that's difficult because that leaflet may just go off, and, and that's uh, that's the dangerous, right? Yeah. So yeah, I think I, it's time now to look what the case looks like, right? So, um, Rado, if you would be possible to share that with us, with my pleasure. Now I would like to take you on a short journey. Uh, I would like you to take all the fully packed room. Uh, for a journey to Wales. Um, so just to show you what uh, happened there in the... Welcome to the University Hospital Wales, Cardiff. Cardiff. My name is uh, Professor Richard Anderson, and uh, I'd like to present to you today a case of a TAVI in TAVI valve implantation. We've been performing transcatheotic valve implantation since 2010. We've done now over 1,300 TAVIs within our institution, both self-expanding and balloon expanding valves. And what we're really going to focus on today is TAVI in TAVI. Professor Richard Anderson is here with us today and uh, I really thank you that he could share his experience with us. The number of these cases is still small and this is why it's so important for us to travel to get this knowledge and to discuss it together. So I will show the example of this patient uh, right now with you. The patient clinical history was that um, uh, he, uh, the, the patient of a male, uh, underwent coronary artery bypassing in 1999 uh, with the two uh, grafts with Lima and the Safinus graft to the RCA. Uh, he underwent also a pacemaker impl implantation because due to the uh, six sinus syndrome and was diagnosed four years later with severe aortic stenosis with the gradients, as you can see on the slides. Also, as you can see, these were the CT measurements uh, planned for the first TAVI, and uh, the, the perimeter was 75.3. The LVOT was a bit smaller. As you can see, the sinuses were wide. And I just take attention at this point because we really need, when we are planning a redo TAVI procedure, to have to look at the index TAVI, just like here, to analyze it fully, what, uh, just to judge what was the first decision on the correct sizing and positioning of the first valve. So the first TAVI procedure was decided to be performed using the core valve 29. The implant was a bit lower, as you will see on the fluoroscopy, with a moderate AR, needing post dilatation with a 23 balloon. And there was just a mild residual central jet, the annual echo follow-up was positive for several years. Then, in 2017, uh, there was an upgrade of the pacemaker. In 2019, a need to perform additional PCI. And in 2020, so two years ago, there was a progressive LV dilatation and severe mitral regurgitation noticed, meaning that last year the patient needed clinical decisions on how to do, what to do, and 2022, you, we, there could be seen a severe central AR. And this reflects actually what uh, Giuseppe Tarantini was saying, that we see most of these degeneration, but half of them going towards aortic regurgitation, which also influences our decision on the height of implantation and also on the, on the leaflet overhang, which, which we can expect. There was no THV calcification also seen on the CT. And this is actually how we are trying to scan using a circular method we used to be doing for bicuspid aortic valves. We are trying to see how the valves which we are deciding on match the first, the index THV 
Uh, and you can see the same can be done on the right picture uh, using a larger circle. So it is not necessary to use the three-dimensional software here, but just make sure that it applies fully to the frame which we are going to treat. And now let's, uh, let's go into the cath lab and feel yourself as operators. Uh, this is the procedure which uh, we, are, we are now currently being taught to do the transfemoral puncture using the ultrasound. As you can see, it was the right femoral uh, for, the, uh, for the additional uh, access, and here, it is the, here is the puncture using the ultrasound approach. And the decision was, because there was also a, whether we will use the pre-dilatation, so here, because of no calcification and, um, and regurgitation, as you can see, quite a deep implantation of what can be seen in the fluoro. The decision was not to do a pre-dilatation in this case, because uh, the expectation was that it will not, uh, it will not uh, benefit the procedure in any way. What is also good to realize is how, what, how the fluoroscopy adheres to what we know. And please have a look. Judging on the counting of the nodes, you can actually realize how deep the valve is. And also, if this is deep, this meaning the, the plane risk, uh, uh, the risk plane is being also deeper, so you, allow, you should reach higher. This is the passage uh, through the valve with the wire. And as you can see, with a pigtail, you can make sure if you are central and not going through the strut. So you just have to wiggle a bit with a, with a pigtail, uh, making sure you are, you, you are central and the pigtail moves freely. And um, also, what we, you should, we should be planning at this stage is uh, counting the notes from the bottom, realizing that the, the valve, which was chosen here to be implanted, was Sapien 3, that it will foreshorten from the bottom and to make sure where the left main is. You can also see here that the, there is LED, and, so, and uh, there are two stands here in the LED and in the circumflex, which can indicate the height of the left main, which we are trying to, to preserve patent. So this is the introduction of the Safari wire. Uh, on this Safari wire, we are going to now to progress to the use of the commander system. And also, what I'm also trying to, to use is to get the fixed projection, CM projection, and also to realize the overlap of struts on some anatomical factors, not to use so much contrast. So as our panel also said, at this point, what we are also doing is using deflection, just not to engage with a, with a frame and to cross the aortic arch and pass, and pass uh, through the valve and also to locate this valve centrally in this, uh, in this corval prosthesis. So this is, um, as you can see, the passage. And you will see, just in a few seconds, that this flexion is truly important because uh, the operators had a bit of problems that the valve was, being, it was stuck with, a, with the opening of the, so with the outflow of the evolute. So they needed to actually to pull it back and also pu push forward in order to pass through it. So this was the engagement. And with a play of the wire, they eventually positioned, um, positioned this um, valve inside the, the core valve. So here is a bit of tension on how to, how to cross if we have the, the, the pushback force uh, from the core valve. And they are agreeing now what to do with the handle, what you can see from the cath lab video. You can also see the opposition from the struts of the outflow of the evolute. And then let's retrieve it a bit, and then turn the handle, and then try to, yeah, so you can see that the struts are being flexed downwards. So this we didn't, don't want to do. And now the valve will, will dive down, like here. And there will be the positioning. So with the positioning, what we are looking at is the relative height from the top frame of the Sapien relative to the left main. And also, we need to agree on how, how deep to, to put this valve to avoid leaflet overhand or allow it. With this AR, what we know is that uh, 
we should probably cover more leaflets with a with a stent because they not, will not be stiff as in aortic stenosis, and so we need to to expand. We need to make sure we have a very proper stimulation uh, during this inflation, and this inflation should not be two seconds or three seconds. This you should fully inflate the syringe and keep it for five at least five seconds to let it expand fully. And at this stage, what we usually do is just to focus on the outcome, because you can see the stance from the LAD and also from the circumflex. We can see the foreshortening from the LVOT and that the, that the curve was much deeper. So now we'll retrieve the balloon and do the contrast injection to check how high the, the implant is. And with this uh, anatomy, I think that the proper targeting of the, annu of the aortic valve annulus is like a native uh, implantation, meaning that if we have a deep implantation of the core valve, we just target the annulus like we would do in a, in a native anatomy. So now we'll just uh, progress to the angiography. And also, what you can also count at this, uh, at this stage while the operators are deciding on, on the position, is first, what is the depth of the Sapien 3 implant? And it seems quite nicely adapting to the native anatomy. Yeah. Also, is the coronary axis preserved? And it is, so it probably will be easy to do this uh, implantation in the future. And also, we can count, and you can see that the Evolute R has nine nodes, counting from the bottom. And the wrist plane is located between the sixth and the, sev and the seventh node. So actually, this positioning was beautifully done and uh, <coughs> with a left main PTC and also full expansion of the leaflets. So the final step would be just to, to take out uh, the, the wire. And uh, there are different uh, maneuvers to do it. The safest one is to use the pigtail just to skip uh, any cut for, of the leaflets. And um, what uh, we'll do with this uh, just uh, final uh, image is to, again, just appreciate this image. And really, we can count first, where is the uh, wrist plane? Where, where was the annulus? The depth of the implant at the patency of the left main. So with this approach, you can actually be sure on the implant position during your, your implantation. From the patient's perspective, we noticed an, a marked improvement in his hemodynamics immediately. He clinically improved in front of our eyes. And from our perspective, implanting this valve in a safe manner was crucial for this patient. And he's subsequently done incredibly well as after he's gone home. He has noticed a marked improvement in his quality of life, which is incredibly satisfying from a physician's perspective. Patient's doing exceptionally well as an outpatient now. He is mobilizing well. He's got a good quality of life in terms of his exertional breathlessness. And most importantly, I think from his perspective, he's not had any further hospitalizations with heart failure. So my summary would be that with such meticulous planning, as shown by the panel, the procedure can be easy and predictable, but we, what we must do is to, in to increase the, our practice and gain experience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rado, and special thanks also to the team from Cardiff for showing this really brilliant implantation, uh, very educative. Before we discuss this, we have a couple more um, cases to share. Maybe, Ole, you can come up, and then we have a common discussion after those. So now we've heard a lot about Sapien and Involute, Sapien and Sapien also a bit. So my task was a bit, there are, of course, other combinations possible. And we strongly believe, in a way, that probably the second valve, the Sapien, is the best option as a second valve because then we keep these new skirts and these problems of coronary access as low as possible. But I want to show you some other combinations with some other different first index uh, TAVI valves. So the first one is Sapien in Portico, or uh, yeah, that was a Sapien in Portico, now it's called Navitor, but this was still a Portico valve, and I can show you. So this was an 81-year-old lady. Actually, that was an 81-year-old lady in 2020, but she got her initial TAVI in 2017. That was a transfermal TAVI as a 77-year-old lady, yeah. a Portico 25. And with a satisfying outcome, I, I will show you the angio uh, later, she had a uh, mean gradient 9 and a mild PVL was set. 
Um, but then in 2020, so that's, you see, I want to show you this, and then I have another case uh, from more recent, from this year. And in 2020, we were not talking a lot about TAF and TAF yet. There was, you never saw this topic on the Congress. We didn't know anything about it, to be honest. So we get this patient, 2020, two years ago, presenting with dyspnea uh, class three. There was some doubt, what is it now? What is, is it, uh, what, what is our real, the origin of her symptoms? There was some mild to moderate, maybe central leak on TE, also mild to moderate PVL. So there was a lot of doubt with, with imagers, like, yeah, is this now significant leak or not? So what, we, what was decided actually was to do more objective quantification of that leakage, and that was in uh, cardiac MR. Regurgitation fraction was almost 35%. There was also some dilatation, as you see, uh, from the left ventricular and diastolic and systolic volumes. So there was uh, taken the decision or the conclusion that there was a significant leak. Whatever it was, para or central, I think it was a combination of both, maybe equally contributing. But also that, we haven't discussed on that, but if you have such, an, uh, such a problem of maybe a mild to moderate central, mild to moderate paravalvular leak, doing the tough and tough often solves both issues, yes, because you will get further expansion of your uh, first prosthesis and you will also reduce or take away uh, the PVL issue. So some, uh, some images. So first you see that's from the index Tavi from 2017, portico predilatation, then the expansion of the prosthesis, the portico prosthesis, and then the final, I can go quickly through this, um, then a post dilatation. And then you see on the, the more important one is you see there on the right hand side. Oh, unfortunately it's not re uh, playing. I can go there again. Uh, let me go back. And then, so you see it's a, um, on the lower end implants, there was a mild, maybe at that moment, I have to say, maybe already a mild plus leak, PVL leak maybe, but okay, it was noticed as uh, she had good uh, diastolic pressures, mild PVL, PVL I can find back in, in the notes. And then, just because the most take home, the best take home message is now you learned about if you do a sapien and an evolute, you'd focus typically on node four, or the outflow part of the sapien on node four, intersection four, five, or six. That's typically the, 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 the area or the region of positioning, of height positioning. Well, how do you do this in, an, uh, in a portico or a navitor? Well, I would say the lowest you can go is, as you see, the, if you put the sapien, the inflow parts, the, inf the bottom of the stand frame aligned with each other. But that, Typically, you don't, when you do the implantation, you don't look at the inflow part, the bottom of the stand frame, right? because you want to know where you want to position your sapien at the top, the top, the outflow of the sapien. You position that where you think you want to have the valve, and all the foreshortening comes from the ventricular side. So that's also important that you realize that. So then it's important to know what is the lowest position you can accept in a portico or navitor. Um, I would say if you have that big cell, you see their coronary axis. If you see that big cell drawn there, um, then at that level, that's, that's the top of the sapien. If you go the highest you can go, is actually you see in real life there will be where do you see the words wording coronary access these uh, will have co co commissural posts you will see these posts on on fluoro so that's if you that's actually the highest you can implant with the top of your sapien i will illustrate this in the mm. uh, right here on the image so you see there the highest you can go is just below these commissural posts the lower implant is actually half a diamond and these diamonds are pretty large in a portico navitor that's the low position so that's maybe the most important you remember if you do portico or navitor in your center for some years already and you get maybe in some years a patient that's typically the area or the zone where we choose about high or low and then that decision of high or low that's all depending on the coronary position and as you see there so in this case we didn't do a, a, a CT after the, as, as a pre procedural planning for the TAF and TAF. Nowadays, I would never do that anymore. But anyway, we were in a way naive still two years ago. We thought, okay, fine, good. We look to the angio. And then you, you see, okay, this is an, an, an implant of around eight millimeters maybe, so on the lowerish end, but still within the boundaries, I think. But um, you see the left main taking off, and that's a good thing. It, very often, uh, and I think Janar has, has pointed this out on, on some other sessions too, if you do, you, it's not forbidden to do a tough and tough without uh, pre-procedural CT, uh, post-index TAVI CT, um, but 
I would strongly advise if you for some reason can't do it, it's really good to work in an, um, to make an aortic root injection in an aleocranial view. Because if you on the S curve you work in an aleocranial, just go 25 aleo, 25 cranial. That's a very good bet. That's in that in that what you will see in that view is that the right and the non coronary cusp overlap on the left hand side of your fluoroscopic view and you will isolate, you will lateralize your left coronary cusp with the left main on the right hand side of your fluoroscopic view. So yep. go to an uh, LEO cranial 20 25 25 make an aortic root injection and then you can almost there without CT then you can see okay my implant is on the lowish end you see my commissural post so my left main is actually if I put, put a line there I can actually go for a high implant in this particular case. Yes everybody agrees. So that was our logic we followed and that was also what was executed. So here you see as I had said you should uh, try to cross these valves with a pigtail. Don't, don't cross it with a teroma really. You, you may go through one of these uh, struts. Then um, here you see the leakage still and then we go, we proceed, oh sorry. We, sorry, here it's already <laughs> implanted. <laughs> and then here you see, so this is maybe interesting to have it paused because the positioning, the positioning is really you look to the top of your sapien. You don't, you're not interested in the bottom because you know it will foreshorten. I, we position the top of the sapien at the same height as the bottom, the bottom of these small commissural posts you see. And then we do the inflation. Uh, uh, it, it thought there was a video normally. Uh, let's see if it plays. Yeah, it plays. So here slow inflation, slow inflation as you see and then we go up and then we, m we manage to get indeed maybe one or two millimeters higher than intended but anyway rather good and we make a sm in injection and you see there's totally no leak. You see also there uh, the coronary so maybe we have two millimeter overlap but it will for sure still be possible to get into this coronary. So this was from two years ago. Now another platform I want to show and discuss still is or maybe any questions from the panel on this case we, we can. On I this think first we discuss case. everything together or let's just go Okay, forward. good. Then Sapien in Accurate. Uh, I think uh, Giuseppe mentioned this already a bit. This is another case um, in 2017 as well. Um, accurate Neo, so not a Neo 2, an Accurate Neo um, large was implanted with really good outcome, no PVL, mean gradient 7. Five years later, uh, severe central leak. Uh, with moderate uh, AS, but I think that's mainly also due to the central leak that these uh, gradients are high. And it's interesting how what to take home from. Uh, so now we do, of course, pre procedural uh, CT planning in, pre in, in planning of uh, TAV in TAV. Um, and what I personally like to do is to start to put my plane. Um, you can't really detect the analyst, the native analyst. It's very hard to say where that is if there is a TAVI valve in, pla in place. So I start, I put my new kind of analyst or my plane at the inflow part, the bottom of my stand frame. And then it's also easy if you do that, then you can really scroll up, especially if you then have an evolute, you can scroll up, make your measurements at node 1, node 2, node 3, node 4. You see also when the coronary comes in, then you see, okay, my coronary comes in at uh, node 6 for example then you know I don't want to typically implant at node 6 I want to implant maybe at node 4 or 5 depending on the implant depth of your index Tavi of course. Here it's a different platform it's like accurate so you have that uh, lower stand a lower crown with and then the upper crown the as you see the lower crown and the upper crown that's the dense network and then you have these large open stabilizing arches. So for an for an accurate Typically what we uh, say are acceptable or the range of implantation low or high it goes the lowest you can go in a way you can maybe in, still go lower but that that's out of uh, recommendation I would say but if it's if your sapien top matches the, up, the top of your upper crown that's your lower implant. Uh, that's like the node 4 for Evolute and then the higher one the node 6 kind of the higher implant level is at the bottom again of these commissural posts. So a bit the same as for an portico navitor the bottom of these posts that's that's considered as the higher implant and then you can maybe even make on your this is purely on CT 3D reconstruction you can almost simulate where that risk plane is going to be of your nail skirt. Uh, so you see there if we go for a low implant we will have a lower neoskirt. Uh, we will have easier coronary 
access still. And we will have slightly more overhanging leaflets, but again, this is a pure AR case, so we didn't really care. And then this is simulated in a higher implant, so where you go for the more the bottom of these commissural poles. You see the risk plan. Um, it is, you see, it doesn't go all the way to the aorta, and that's because of that restriction of the, the leaflets of the accurate. They don't really completely open up. Um, to the sides uh, of the frame, it leaves some kind of gap thanks to that. Uh, you see, it matches almost with that up upper crown that sticks out, so that's kind of a gap. So that's the simulation. So I think probably in real life, if you, we would have gone, we have not gone for a high implant, we went for a low implant, but if you would have gone for a high implant, I still think there would have been space enough uh, to, to canal cannulate the coronaries. Yeah? So then we see the case here. So this is crossing in. Crossing of an accurate is the most tricky one. Yes, yeah? so really be careful. Um, and what is really important here is when, so you cross with the pigtail, and then when you have your pigtail in, what you have to, you have to do a swing test, we call it. So you have to go to a projection where you, fluoroscopic projection, where you overlap two of the commissural posts and you isolate the other one. And then what you want to see is that you can push your pigtail crossing from, on your fluoroscopic screen from left to right over these overlapping posts. If you can't do this, you're sure you went beyond one of the stabilizing arches. So that's really, you need to see this. So I do that here. Yeah? So I push my, I'm able to push my uh, pigtail on the left of my overlapping posts, and also I see it on the, on the right. Yeah? So then I know I'm nice central, I didn't caught on these uh, stabilizing arches. Then if you've done that, uh, of course, no predilatation here, and then uh, I position again. This is yeah. This is maybe interesting still. This is trichoscope planar view, as normally you would implant uh, both official recommendations for an accurate and a sapien. But you see, I position. I try to position the top of my sapien with the top of these upper crown. I do that, but I see. There's a lot of parallax, actually, and uh, this improves really en enormously if I go to my right-left Kaspovola view. So I go to a right-left Kaspovola view. Now you don't appreciate it very much with the fluor, but you s see that translucent line in, my, in the sapien too. So both valves are better aligned. So I decided to implant the sapien in a right-left Kaspovola view in my accurate. And then again, you will see the expansion. So here I'm still too high. I go with the wheel a little bit clockwise to go a little bit more ventricular. Now I'm happy. My colleague he goes up with the balloon. I correct a little bit. Now I'm happy. You see, s go slow, make a positioning, and now I position, and it's perfectly aligned with the top of the upper crown. Yeah, and then um, yeah, so a perfect result, no leak anymore. And I can tell you in this case, I don't know if I recorded it uh, here in this. Yeah, we went into the coronaries just to show you. It's very very easy to get still uh, in the coronaries with a catheter, and that's in most of the combinations. There's a lot of nice bench test work from Janar, from Arif, from other people uh, that uh, with sapien and, and accurate you can maintain really nice coronary access still. So that were the two uh, other combinations I wanted to um, to show, and maybe we can discuss this now. Uh, thank you so much, Ola. Th I'm sure there are questions on the floor. Dan, can you open up? Yeah, I mean, one question. Is there a risk of balloon rupture when performing balloon expandable THV in the Evolute, or indeed, I guess, any of the other uh, valve types? Is that a concern more with TAV and TAV than in other scenarios? Not really. They're all shaking their heads. No, not really. What about that first? I mean, the live case we saw from Cardiff, one of the thoughts I had was that there was under, relative under-expansion, asymmetrical expansion of the sapien, which is inevitable to some extent because the waist of the evolute is smaller than the sapien. Would any of the panel, you know, maybe uh, Francesco, I can ask you, would you have been tempted to post-dilate that because you want more symmetrical expansion of the sapien to perhaps uh, optimize durability? Okay, this is a, a good question, and I don't know the answer, honestly. I mean, what is, we don't know, but uh, I will consider the patient that I have in front of me. If it's a young patient, again, uh, uh, I'm still looking at lo long term, despite this is the second procedure, and the under expansion is very visible, maybe yes. Otherwise, I mean, in this case, it was, I mean, to me, it was minimal under expansion. I will be, I will ac accept these results happily. Maybe, Dan, I can ask you a question, actually, that <laughs> you also come into place for answering here. You know, we've seen in that great case uh, that the outcome was particularly good because the core valve was sitting a bit deeper. But, you know, in the last years, we learned to implant the core valve and evolutes as high as possible to reduce the number of pacemakers. 
But in the light of, you know, TAF and, and TAF, um, maybe that's not the right way to go. Would, would you now, it's a bit um, provocative, but would you now start implanting the Evoluts a tiny bit deeper again to make them good targets for a TAF and TAF? Yeah, I think it's a great point. And it's interesting, we've done some cases in younger patients where, with different valve types where we've aimed to deploy deeper, but we are so programmed to deploy high that it's actually quite difficult to make yourself deploy deeper. But yeah, I think it comes to, Looking at younger patients like Giuseppe, what we do if we have a patient under 75, if we're going to consider them for, for TAVI, then we always look at the CET to work out if we can do redo TAVI. And then we think about the depth of implantation if we are going to go for TAVI to ensure that we're going to be able to do a redo procedure and that we're not going to risk coronary obstruction. So I think that, you know, it's critical that we start thinking about that, especially in, in younger patients. Or as Giuseppe said, more importantly, patients with longer life expectancies. And I think that's another really important point that I was going to try and bring out. I don't know how many people in their heart team meetings look at a patient's life expectancy rather than their age. And it's, I think it's something we're not very good at doing. In the UK, there is a, a government Office of National Statistics app where you can put in the patient's age and gender and it'll tell you what their life expectancy is. But that's obviously pretty crude. We don't know about how comorbidities impact on that. But I think that's something we need to start switching in the heart team meetings to thinking about a patient's life expectancy when we make these decisions, surgery versus TAVI and redo TAVI, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, there's a, you know, I mean, the one thing I think to stress on the life ex management, lifetime management is that there's a lot of enthusiasm for using TAVI. Obviously, patients are asking for it. And, you know, there was staggering data from TCT for me that in 2021, in patients under the age of 65, 48% had, had TAVI in the US. Now, the thing is, if you look at the comment about repeatability, if you put a TAVI in that is not repeatable, you're doing that patient a disservice. And they probably should have had surgery because you can easily do a valve and valve and a failed surgical valve. So I think the pendulum has to be right that you're thinking about the next procedure, not necessarily, you know, yes, the TAVI is a quicker recovery and potentially an easier course for the patient, but in 10 years, you know, explant is not necessarily straightforward. Yes. Another question from the audience. Um, Ola, maybe you can take this one. What about core valve in core valve or evolute in core valve? Is that an option that you would consider? And well, what are the issues? Good question. I mean, I've done a couple of these. Um, well. Clearly, I would say it's not optimal. I mean, you're going to make your NEOS curve really long. For coronary access, I think for almost any valve, this combination, the second valve, it's really best to keep the, the stand frame as short as possible. I think that we have to be honest about that. And then the other issue is really, and that's uh, if you do a core valve and a core valve, you may have the intention to position this valve maybe five millimeter. You go with nice intentions and a great procedural plan in your cat lab. And you go say, I want to position this valve five millimeters higher. But what may happen, and I've had sometimes this, that you go, you try to go a bit higher or a bit lower, but then these valves, because they have the same kind of shape, if with the release, it actually settles it at exactly the same position. Mm. So that's another drawback of putting an of Evolute and Evolute or an Avitor and Avitor. I, I think it's not ideal because these valves have the tendency to put themselves into the same configuration as the other valve. So having there a balloon expandable or just a valve which puts itself just purely with radial forces, you're probably more have accuracy, accuracy in the positioning. You can say, I go two millimeters higher, two millimeters lower, and if you really want, you can obtain this. It's harder with these self-expanding and self-expanding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think just as a quick comment, I would say that, yeah, I think really the strategy for most of these ideally would be a balloon expandable in an Evolute. You know, I just want to exercise a word of caution about leaflet overhang. I mean, we're dealing with a compromised situation because we don't have another tool, right, that's easy and reproducible to do. Mm. I mean, the, the human body was never designed to have leaflets that overhang the native leaflets. And in actual fact, you could argue that potentially having regurgitant leaflets that are floppy is potentially more detrimental because, you know, you're going to impact the, how laminar that flow is and have valves that are partly in series. You know, if you have a stenosed valve it might, if, and you pin 50% of it, it might actually just say still open. And we're trying to do some of that testing in explanted valves. But this is a compromised situation. It's not really, if we had a choice, none of us would say, hey, we're going to give you some leaflet overhang, you're right? Yeah. Can I make a quick comment also related to the core valve in core valve? So actually, when you have a very narrow ascending aorta, 
it's not, not ideal. I think it's better not to go like that because this valve has a more closer design. And actually the only way to get the coronary is to go outwards. So you need to have a very large ascending aorta because you create not only you know, a cover stent in a cover stent, but actually you need to know that with a more closed cell design, when you have a misalignment of the cells, it's really difficult mm. to get through with a catheter. You need to work, you know, if you go in from inside, you need to work with a wire and the things that without any support. So the only way is to go from outside. So the, it means that you need to have 50 millimeter of ascending aorta. Otherwise, it's going to be a mess. So this is the reality, I think. But Henrik, uh, you as a surgeon, I mean, there's also, I think, Giuseppe mentioned this uh, uh, earlier, not today, but another session once, that if you, have, let's say you have, your patient is really having a failing uh, evolute and you know if you're going to put in a a second valve there you're gonna occlude or sequester uh, sequestration there was an option mentioned like that you as a surgeon you could go to yes take I, the leaflets I out to the sur yes I you to the surgeon because they used to make the bantle to remove everything but I'm a simple mind so what I ask is why don't you cut just the leaflet and you put another valve without removing everything so this is the question for you <laughs> now because nobody is able to answer, they don't know why. Well, in very special circumstances, you can think about this, doing surgery, just leaflet uh, exertion and then place a valve, but I've never done that. It must be a very special case to do. Yeah. If we would have now tools, of course, to remove safely remove leaflets and then place another valve interventionally, that would, of course, be fantastic. So there's a place to work and please develop something for us and then we're happy to do so. Um, unfortunately, we have to end this. We could discuss for hours about this topic because it's so young, so new. We all have to learn. I uh, especially learned a lot. To the third valve. Yeah, we can do the third valve. Well, that is done for next year or the year after, maybe. But first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank Edwards for sponsoring this session. And the Edwards people have been very incremental in, in really helping us to design this. And there's one person I'd like to highlight is Philip Marx. He should be here, but he got COVID like lastly. <laughs> and this is so unfortunate that he can't be with us here today. And, um, but we also want to announce, you know, we, we put stuck our heads together and, and build up a white paper on how to do this. And this initiative was led by Giuseppe and by Rado. And maybe the two of you can just, you know, briefly uh, show the concept. So actually, you know, this is a kind of operative guidance that actually has been developed by all the people that you see here. And, uh, you know, I think it's useful because it's a really simple step-by-step you know, recommendation on how to perform this procedure. So this is not just for scientists, it's mainly for practitioners. Actually, as Janar used to recall me many times, we need to have more evidence for sure, but as he told all of us before, we need to find out the right compromise. That is mainly based on bench tests, experience and many other things. I hope that will be helpful to, you know, to get it published very soon. And I think it's going to be something useful for all of you. And uh, also something to look out for is to also to like, add addition to the white paper is please look out for the registry of the redo interventions, which is uh, currently registered and being implemented now in the European countries. I hope it will give the scientific uh, background and justification to what we will be doing. Good. And with this, thanks to all for coming and have a nice uh, PCR final day. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.